privilege of hosting a former Prime Minister of Belgium, an alumni of our university, and President-elect of the European Council, Charles Michel. In only 10 days, Mr. Michel will assume his role as President of the European Council, chairing and organizing the meetings of the heads of state of the EU28. This is indeed a unique opportunity for us to learn a little bit about his presidency beforehand. Myself and my colleague Alexander, in partnership with Machiavelli, will host Mr. Michel for an interview here at Room for Discussion, where you, the audience, will have an opportunity to ask Mr. Michel your questions. Given the special nature of today's event, we will not only be taking questions from the audience here, present today, but also from our online viewers at home through our Facebook live stream. So if you are at home and would like to ask Mr. Michel an audience question, please submit your question as a Facebook comment, and we will select from the most popular ones. Before then, however, Mr. Michel will first deliver a short speech to you, the students and staff of the University of Amsterdam, for the first time in his official capacity as president-elect of the European Council. Therefore, please help me welcome him to the podium, president-elect Charles Michel. Thank you. Dames en heren, beste studenten, dat is voor mij een uh, zeer emotionele moment. Twintig uh, jaar geleden was ik hier, uh, een student in Amsterdam, in het kader van een Erasmus-project, en daarom ben ik zo tevreden om hier opnieuw, twintig jaar later, aanwezig te zijn. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it's a pleasure for me to be back at the University of Amsterdam. I spent six months studying here as an Erasmus student, and I have many nice memories of this city. For example, when I arrived, I bought a used bike from someone in the street. <laughs> you know what comes next? Two weeks later, my bike was stolen. Then a few weeks later, someone in the street offered to sell me a used bike. And it was my bike. <laughs> so I buy it the same bike twice. Today, I am very happy to make a formal announcement. If anybody has my old bike, I would like to buy it a third time. <laughs> Dear students, the Erasmus program is a great European success story. Almost four million students have participated. An impressive statistic. But there is another statistic I prefer. Around one million babies have been born to Erasmus Chapel. And who knows, maybe some of you will add to this statistic in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, today I would like to speak about Europe, our common home. Imagine for a moment if Europe did not exist. Who would lead the fight against climate change? Who would defend our rights and freedoms? And more concretely, who would eliminate roaming charges across Europe? And who would ban single-use plastics? Europe does all these things and much more. Europe should be prouder and more self-confident about how we have improved people's daily lives. Today, we are free to love who we want, free to express our opinions without fear, free to get justice in fair courts, free to access independent media, free to travel and live across borders. We should never take these freedoms for granted. A few weeks ago, we marked the fall of the Berlin Wall, a momentous occasion for both Germany and Europe. It reminds us how far we have come from the old Cold War divisions. Today, democracies and free market economies stretch across our continent. This offers unprecedented opportunity to our citizens. That's why I ask myself, 
why all the pessimism today? Just look at how much we have achieved since those dark days. I have met young people here in Amsterdam and all across Europe. You want to take your destiny into your own hands, and you are not alone. Support for Europe is growing. The recent European elections showed that Europeans came out in record numbers, especially young people, to make their voices, their voices heard, loud and clear. A positive sign for the future of Europe, trust in the European Union is at a 10-year high. But these elections also tell the complex story of Europe. The hopes, the fears, the dreams of our citizens from the four corners of our continent. Europe is a colorful patchwork of different identities, cultures, traditions and perspectives. And yes, also with competing interests. And I love that about Europe. For me, it is our uniqueness. But it also makes Europe a challenging place to do politics, find compromise and take action. I come from Belgium, a country with six governments, seven parliaments, three national languages and more than a thousand beers. Across Europe, there are eight political groups in the European Parliament, 24 official languages, and 50,000 different beer brands. So I should feel right at home in my new job. It certainly won't be brewing. We are a union of 28 democracies with open debates, political parties, and free press where we are able to have open discussions and disagreements. For me, this is not a sign of weakness, it is a sign of strength. As long as we are able to agree on the most important thing to stand together, unified for our common good, and putting labels on people doesn't help either. When I speak to people across Europe, they don't say, I am an elite, or I am a populist. They say, I care about my family. I care about my job. I care about my future. I believe we all want the same things. It is how we get there that matters. Young Europeans, in particular, are expressing their grand ambition for Europe, especially on climate change. Europe needs more confident thinking, and we have reason to be confident. Because we speak from a position of strength, the economic power of 500 million consumers representing 20% of the global GDP. Today, the world is changing at lightning speed. Your generation knows this better than anyone. Climate, digitalization, and geopolitics are radically changing the way we live, this can create a feeling of anxiety, a questioning of the traditional bonds of family, community, and country. But I believe it is how we respond to these challenges that will define us and influence Europe's future. We need tolerance, openness, and mutual respect, and certainly not a bunker mentality. Europe is built on the solid foundation of cooperation, fair trade and the rules-based order. These are not empty words. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, today climate change is threatening our very existence. We must address it with laser focus. We must shift into high gear. We must lead and inspire others to act. The numbers speak for themselves. Over 90% of geophysical disasters are climate-related. 
These disasters have killed 1.3 million people between 1998 and 2017. The economic losses from climate-related disasters are hundreds of billions of euros. This simply cannot continue. Only firm leadership will energize people to act. I want Europe to be the first climate neutral continent. And to achieve this, we need to transform our economy and our society and mobilize private and public investments. Climate change is not the end of the story. Human history shows that obstacles are often unique opportunities to make progress, innovation, new technologies, a better quality of life. This is what we need now urgently. Bold climate action could trigger trillions of euros in economic benefits and create millions of jobs in the sustainable energy sector alone. We must seize this opportunity. Europe will promote the Paris Agreement on climate change and your generation has taken to the streets to demand action for a healthy planet. We are all in the same boat. I share your urgency. Ladies and gentlemen, to be a strong leader, Europe needs a strong economy. But today, our open economy is being questioned. Countries and companies are throwing out the rule book, taking an unpredictable attitude to globalization. We must stand our ground, promote a level playing field, and take an integrated approach to the economy. A strong, healthy economy help, helps our societies flourish while driving down poverty and inequality. We need to speed up economic reforms that clear the way for young innovators with game-changing ideas. But we need to do it the open way, with social fairness, with equal access to the labor market, fair working conditions and social protection. Greater European unity will provide more stability, more security and more fairness for our citizens. Europe is at the forefront of global cooperation, a credible, respected and valued partner at the international table. So we shouldn't be shy about promoting our interests and values more confidently. We must be at the table, not aggressive, but more assertive, self-confident at the heart of today's core debate. I believe we can be more assertive in three areas. First, trade. I am in favor of free trade and entrepreneurship. Europe needs to build a new generation of trade agreement around the world based on transparency and high social and climate standards. The second way is to better support our digital and private sector companies. Europe must harness the vast potential of digitalization and move fast on breakthrough technologies, just like you are doing here in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is home to one of the most vibrant startup ecosystems in the world, in biotech, electric mobility, and healthcare, for, to, to name just a few. Last year alone, Dutch startups raised more than 500 million euros in investment, and Amsterdam was Europe's fourth biggest startup hub. We should increase our support for these kind of startups, they are the lifeblood tomorrow of, of tomorrow's economy. Our digital strategy must be compatible with our European values. Today, big data is on the digital agenda. It has evolved into a massive economic resource, but we must protect consumers' privacy and individual freedoms along the way. I firmly believe we can do both, compete with the global tech giants on innovation and build markets that are good for people, business and society. 
Along these same lines, our tax policy should be fair and balanced too. Companies should contribute to the countries where they make their profits. In my views, this is common sense. The third area where Europe can be more efficient is defense and security. We need to improve our defense capacity if we want to influence global events and protect our interests. Bolstering our joint defense capabilities and investing smarter is the way forward. A strong NATO and a strong European defense are complementary with NATO and within NATO. More cooperation on security and defense will advance Europe's strategic autonomy in the long term. Ladies and gentlemen, the best project in the world is nothing without a good strategy. So we must remain united, never forget our past, and build our common future. Finding pragmatic solutions, common sense, to our most pressing problems is the hard part. I want to encourage an unshakable unity between the European leaders and promote workable solutions in a spirit of openness and dialogue. Confidence and common sense are the best tools to move forward. I want to build a foundation of trust with other leaders and among people. The interests of all European countries are interlocking and part of the same bigger picture. We all want the same things for our families and countries, a healthy, prosperous, sustainable Europe. But how we get there is open for debate. I won't hide behind bureaucratic jargon, institutional competition, or mountains of red tape. I want a frank and honest conversation that leads to decisions and actions. That's why I am here today. I want a conversation with everyone, not just head of states of governments. I want to understand your hopes, your dreams, even your fears for the future. Please get involved. Don't stay on the sidelines. We need Europe's young generation, your energy, your optimism, your talents, your fresh ideas. Never underestimate your power to change the status quo. Get involved to innovate, to create, to step forward. Little by little, day by day, together we can build a Europe of common values based on common sense that works for all of us. Thank you. The seats, it works. the seats are much more beautiful in comparison with 20 years ago. <laughs> so, welcome Mr. Michel. Hello. Nice to have you. Hello. Welcome to Room for Discussion. Welcome back to the University of Amsterdam. We'd like to jump straight into the interview and uh, make reference to your speech. You sounded very optimistic, but it's very clear that your partners in the EU are not always so confident. When we look at the French President Emmanuel Macron, in his recent interview, he said explicitly that Europe is facing an internal crisis. Allow me to quote him here. He says that a north-south divide on economic issues, an east-west divide on policy of immigration issues, results in resurgence of populism all over Europe. Would you agree with him? Is Europe in crisis? It is, no, it, it, is, it is correct that the last years at the European level, we have faced many crises, many difficulties. The financial crisis, uh, the budgetary crisis, the migration crisis, and we, we had the feeling the last years that we were only there in order to try to find solutions uh, after, after this crisis. My, my conviction is um, very clear. I think that more than ever, we have a window of opportunity because we have a strategic agenda. We know what are the priorities for the next years at the European level. And we have indeed to 
to have a dialogue, a strong dialogue between the 27 countries after Brexit and to, and to decide. But I'm confident because I have the feeling that it will be possible to decide on different topics. Point one, climate change. Climate change is a very important issue, a crucial issue. Uh, we made a lot of progress the last month because we are not far uh, to share the same goals uh, uh, regarding climate change. The Open Green Deal, the new commission will present in the next uh, weeks uh, his plan in order to implement concrete measures. It will not be easy. We have to talk with the people to see how we Realistic it is to implement all these uh, uh, measures uh, we need. The digitalization is also an important topic in which it's possible to try to, to work more together. Um, it's true that uh, we have difficult discussions. It's true that there are different opinions at the open level. But it's also true that it's possible, in my opinion, to try to take decisions. And I think in the next month, it will be a window of opportunity. And I hope that we will seize this opportunity. But let's also discuss sort of the elephant in the room in the next month, which is, of course, Brexit. Um, your the current president, Tusk, has been very uh, open in his regret over Brexit, working towards providing extensions where ne when necessary. You, on the other hand, in the past have been quite open, I would say, to a more no-deal scenario approach. How will you manage this, uh, these negotiations in the coming month bef leading up to January 31st? Will you work to persuade for a no-deal no scenario? F f first of all, it is obvious that I, that I, that I regret uh, the choice uh, made by the British people uh, in the referendum. But we have to show respect for this choice and for this uh, referendum. And my observation is only that the, the, the last three years, we remained united, the 27 countries. It was not easy, it was not obvious. But it, is, but it was a, a very strong signal for the, for the future. And, and again, a few weeks ago, we have agreed uh, the withdrawal agreement. We are waiting for the British decision. We'll see what will happen uh, after the next uh, British elections in December. But we are ready. We are ready, the 27 countries, in order to negotiate the next steps. And for the future, I'm very clear. I'm in favor of a very close cooperation with the uh, United Kingdom. It's important for uh, our economic development, it's important for, for the future of trade between the different uh, uh, British and European companies, but it's also important for our common security. We share the same values with uh, this uh, important and, and great country, but in the next steps we will promote and defend our own interest. And for example, uh, the single market, the integrity of the single market will be an important uh, point we have to, to protect. We will also uh, be very committed in order to, to, to protect the peace in Ireland and uh, especially uh, the Good Friday Agreement. So then let's discuss about the future relationship with the United Kingdom. I think you've already touched upon of some of these points. Assume January 31st all goes well and we have a deal on the table. Of course, that is only the beginning because we have the trade agreement still to negotiate with the United Kingdom. How will you aim to steer the EU27 then in this negotiating process? I think, I think a very important point is the transparency in this process of negotiations. It's very important for all member states to be well informed, not to have the feeling that, uh, that uh, we would play without uh, some, uh, some countries. And we have also, in the next two weeks, uh, to identify what are our concrete priorities for the next negotiation. I think that trade will be an important point, but uh, also security will be a very important point. How is it possible to, to work uh, together in order to guarantee the, 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 the security of our citizens? Mm -hmm. And let's say things don't go so well. Let's think on the 31st of January, there is no deal on the table. A scenario that's not difficult to imagine nowadays. Will you? go for persuading your colleagues to accept an extension? It's not my intention to, to, to express uh, an opinion without knowing what will happen uh, uh, after the next elections. Mm -hmm. And we have to show respect for, for the British institutions. Uh, they took the decision to organize, to, to organize these elections. We will see what, uh, what happened. But it's, uh, it's um, certain, in my opinion, that we, we, we have to remain united. And I think it's possible to remain united and to decide together with the 27 members what's uh, what's the next step based on the results of these elections? Mm -hmm. Mr. Michel, we heard a lot of references to the future of Europe in your speech, to Europe's global position. Recently, you have clearly stated that the EU must act boldly and confidently on the global arena, specifically with confronting China and Russia. 
Is this the right strategy for the European Union to confront these nations? I have, I have the feeling that, uh, that, that, that Europe has a stronger role to play at the international level. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to promote our interests, we have to promote our values. We will never be aggressive uh, or negative, but it's important to be more assertive, I think. And that's why I, I consider that we have to uh, identify what are our common strategic priorities for the next years at the international level. First of all, I think that we have to develop a, a new partnership, a new alliance in the south of Europe with Africa, with this big continent. We have to identify how it will be possible with these countries to work together in order to support more development and more efficiency in our development policies, uh, not only speaking about uh, humanitarian aid, not only speaking about migration, but to see with these countries how is it possible to be more attractive for the private investments, to develop uh, the infrastructures. It's very, very important for the future of the European Union, point one. Point two, uh, Russia or China, we have to try to be lucid and to see how is it possible uh, to uh, um, identify how, is it, uh, how, how we can, how we can uh, improve our influence. Look, Russia, for example. It is our neighbor, and the geography will not change, uh, not in the short term, not in the long term. It means that, uh, on the one hand, we have to be very strong, very firm. Uh, we promote, we defend the Minsk agreement regarding the sovereignty of Ukraine. It's a clear position because we have to protect our external borders, uh, and on the other hand, uh, we have also to see which channel of dialogue, of political di dialogue, can be uh, useful. At the moment, we see that uh, this uh, dialogue between the European countries is very important in order to be on the same page at the strategic level. And do you have a channel in mind? Of leading dialogue with partners like Russia and China? It is, it is, a, it is a, a permanent dialogue that we have in the European Council. And uh, we, we know that uh, the different member states, uh, they have different sensitivities, different opinions based on their own histories uh, in the relationship uh, with, uh, with Russia. And uh, I repeat that uh, I'm very clear, we have to be strong uh, and we cannot accept uh, some behaviors uh, from, from Russia. Uh, we cannot accept the cyber attacks. We cannot accept disinformation. We, can, uh, we cannot accept uh, the lack of respect uh, for the territorial sovereignty. Uh, but uh, we know also at the international level that we have to, uh, to see how is it possible to improve the relationship, to have more stability, to have more predictability. And this, this is a strategic decision that we have that we have to, 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 to develop between the members. Well, let's also now look at the other side of this, which is what you've called our strongest ally, the United States. Recently, you also said that we have fallen to victim to their trade war with China. Going into the future, do you also see Europe engaging in a more independent strategy from the United States, seeking out our own interests, seeking to distinguish ourselves from them? In, in, my, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's uh, clear and I'm certain that the uh, United States is an important ally for Europe. Uh, it has been in the past and it will remain uh, an important uh, partner for the future and an important ally for the future. But at the same time, at the, at the geopolitical level, at the international level, we can see very often that if we share the same goals, we don't share uh, always uh, the same tools or, or the same approach in order to, to reach uh, the, the goals we, we share. Look at the GCPOA with Iran, for example. Uh, I don't say this uh, nuclear deal is perfect, but this is a channel in order to try to improve the situation, to improve the possibilities for more safety, for more security, for more uh, stability. Uh, climate change is another good example. The Paris Agreement is very important for us. And we can see uh, this uh, American administration not convinced at the moment that this Paris Agreement is a necessity. And it means that we have to, 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 to be a, a, strong, a strong actor at the international level in order to defend, to promote our, our visions, our, our interests, our values. Strong partnership with the United States, no, no hesitation, no doubt, but at the same time, we have to develop a kind of uh, strategic autonomy at the European level.
So in your capacity as president, how will you, with meeting with American leaders, ensure this vision? Uh, you know, at the international level, we, we have to, to avoid the misunderstanding and we have to, to try to, to, to nourish the permanent dialogue in order to understand the different opinions, the different views, because um, being lucid, uh, having a good knowledge, a good understanding of the domestic situation, of the different opinions, is the first step before we can discuss a compromise, before we can uh, see how is it possible to, to make progress uh, together. And that's why it's important for me, for me as president of the Council, to, to have this uh, strong dialogue and, and this permanent uh, discussion, exchange of views uh, with uh, the American authorities and to identify how we can work together. A good example is NATO. Uh, NATO is a strong alliance, and after the two world wars, uh, this uh, strong alliance has played a very important important role for the peace in Europe, for the prosperity, for the security. Uh, it means that we have also to, to identify the priorities for the future of NATO. Is it possible for NATO, for example, to play in the future a stronger role in order to fight against the cyber attack, in order to guarantee peace and stability, uh, and, and, and especially uh, to, 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 to be a strong partner in order to, to defend uh, our interests? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to hear that you're very optimistic about NATO, but very recently European leaders have been increasingly calling for greater defence cooperation in Europe. What is your stance on the European army? Yeah, it's it's, um, it's um, um, obvious, in my opinion, that uh, NATO is an important uh, international institution, multilateral institution. But the question is a question for the leaders of the country's member, members of this alliance. What do we want for the future? What do we want for our common uh, alliance in the future? I think at the European level that we have to do more and to be more efficient uh, regarding our common European defense, not against NATO, but with NATO and within NATO. Um, if we would like to play a stronger role at the international level, it is important to be able to guarantee the same safety of the different European countries uh, and that's why I think uh, that in the next months it's also uh, part of uh, the decisions we have to, to take. We made at European level interesting progress regarding our European defence the last years. Uh, it's positive, it is fruitful, fruitful, but it's not enough. We have to be to be more committed and to, and to make more progress. And I think it's possible because I feel that uh, the, the different positions in the countries are moving in the right way. So on China, on Russia, on the United States and on defense, how will you help to organize the EU28, EU27 to speak in one voice, to speak with a common position on our global stage? Uh, Based on my experience the last five years as a member of the European Council, as a Belgian Prime Minister, I think that the, the first important point is the confidence between the leaders. If you have a lack of confidence, it's not possible to take decisions together. And the first point we have to do is to develop the trust uh, between us. I think it's possible. And, and I, I feel the progress we have made uh, the last months is very important for the, for the future. There is a new leadership at the Commission's level. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, in principle, will start with her commission in December, a new leadership in the Council, a new European Parliament. It is a good occasion, it is a good moment in order to try to, to, to upgrade, strengthen this feeling of trust and to take decisions. And I, I repeat that the positive point is that we know what are the priorities at the European level. And we have to see how we can take decisions, how we can build strong compromises. Well, thank you, Mr. Michel. As we promised now, we would like to give our audience an opportunity to ask you some questions. So if you would like to ask Mr. Michel a question, please raise your hand up and we will point to someone. Could we get, please, the gentleman in the brown jacket here at the front, Nino? Keep your hand up, please, sir. High up so that Nino can see you. No, sorry, this one here with the glasses. Yeah, awesome. Please stand up, uh, sir. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Michel, for coming today to hold this speech um, from the first. We um, who believe in Europe um, see how come within the European um, dimension some forces are not that happy with Europe and uh, apparently we have to give an answer. So do you think that the United States of Europe is an uh, unavo unavoidable um, goal for us? 
Uh, one question? Or yes. Okay. Uh, no, thank you for this. Thank you for this question. Um, the European Union is a, is a process. Uh, in my opinion, it is a, a unique political project in the world because if you if you look uh, at the past, you see that uh, after two dramatic, two tragic world wars, different countries and the leaders of these countries took the decision to work together in order to try to, to build step by step, day after day, a space uh, for more peace, for more security, for more prosperity. And I think that uh, in the future we have to, to continue to make progress in order to, to cooperate more together, but with respect for the, the, the national traditions, to, with respect for the, the, national, the, the national institutional systems. And the priority for me, for example, it's not to open a big debate uh, about the reform of the treaties. My priority, based on the current treaties, is to see how is it possible to be more efficient and to get results, results in order to deal with uh, this uh, difficult challenge, uh, climate change, to deal with the digitalization, to deal also with uh, the importance, in my opinion, to make progress at the economic level, because it is the best guarantee for a social protection model. Okay, we would like to take one more question from our live audience here. Somebody from the right side this time. Uh, gentleman in the blue and black shirt here towards the front, please. Oh, okay. Hi, Mr. Michel. I have a question regarding the current and future China-EU relation. So earlier this year, EU published an official paper that descri described China as a systematic rival. However, several days later, there were some EU member states, for example, Italy and Luxembourg, uh, uh, signed a Belt and Road Initiative memorandum with China. And where there were other some EU member states uh, leaders, for example, Emmanuel Macron of French that uh, state China is implementing that diplomacy with other countries in Europe, also African countries. So do you think that uh, the current different approaches and attitudes toward uh, China would potentially endanger the uh, EU solidarity and the unity uh, in the future? And uh, furthermore, how do you lead the EU countries to treat China uh, more as a strategic partner or more as a systematic rebel as described in the EU official paper? I think we only have enough time to answer the first probably part of your question. Yeah. No, my, my, my priority would be to, to avoid in the future a new form of cold war between United States, the United States and China. And that's why I think that Europe has an important role to play, to be a strong partner at the, the international level. Point one. Point two, China is an important country. China is an important power. And next year, we will have an important summit, Europe-China, after the summer in Germany. And it is my wish to prepare this summit and to identify with the 27 countries what are our priorities regarding the relationship with China. In my opinion, there are different priorities, but certainly two will be very important. Trade is important. It means that we have to guarantee a real level playing field between the European companies and China. We have to find the right balance between openness on the one hand and protection on the other hand. I don't say protectionism, I say protection. In the past, maybe, uh, we were uh, naive regarding this uh, important issue of a level playing field regarding the trade, the, the, the trade topics, the trade issues, and point two, climate change. I think that for this country, and it is also the case for Europe, it's important to see how is it possible to try to work together. It's also a strategy in order to avoid uh, the environmental dumping and to guarantee uh, the level playing field between uh, these two important, those two important uh, continents. All right, so I think we can have one more audience question here present. Uh, let's see. Excuse me, sir. We have. So, excuse me. Democratic states. Would you believe that our union itself should also be democratic? Sir, could you keep the distance, please? But thank you for your thank you for your message, and I confirm that in favour of democracy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So let's see if we can get one more audience question. Uh, the 
<laughs> the lady in the back over there with the glasses, please keep your hand up so that Nino can find you. Yes, hello, very, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my question is rather simple. I'm wondering if you think that it is possible for the European Union to promote both economic interest without undermining climate interest. Ah, thank you. It's a, good, it's a good question. In, in the past, traditionally, we opposed economic development, economic interest on the one hand, and uh, the challenge, climate change, on the other hand. It's a mistake, I think. And I think that more than ever, we have to, 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 to consider that it will be possible to face this uh, difficult uh, challenge, climate change, and at the same time, to develop innovation, to develop the new technologies. Uh, one example, uh, the investments we need at the European level in order to support more growth, to support more jobs. I'm confident and I'm certain that uh, this top priority, climate change, is a unique occasion in order to develop the capacities for these countries at the open level to create more added value with, with another approach, because indeed in the, in the past we, we have we have showed uh, to, to, we, 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 we didn't show uh, enough respect for the for the natural resources, and we have to identify another strategy, another approach, and it will be, I think, the the goal number one for the European Union in the next years. How is it possible to uh, to to succeed? Uh, how is it possible to to uh, to win uh, this battle uh, in order to be able to guarantee to guarantee a sustainable future and at the same time to guarantee a high quality of life for the citizens for the people? Thank you, Mr. Michel. Thank you for that question. We have some questions coming in from our on online audience. So, Nina, could you please ask you to read a, a question out? Uh, hi. Yeah, the question that comes in from our online audience is know. the following one. Dear Mr. Michel, is there any concrete individual European plan that would... Where are you? That would I don't see you. He's here. He's, He's online. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I will, I will repeat again. Dear Mr. Michel, is there any concrete individual European plan that would truly allow the transformation of European society into one that respects and protects the environment? Could you refer them? I'm not sure if, uh, I've understood well your question. Okay, this, our online audience uh, asked you if there's any concrete uh, European plan that would allow the transformation of European society yeah. into one that respects and protects the environment. So maybe you can comment the, on, the, on the Green New Deal. Yeah, the, 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 the European Green Deal is the, is the key, I think. And uh, we have tried the last, uh, the last years uh, uh, at the national level, at the European level, to, to develop concrete projects, concrete measures, but it's not enough. The, the ban uh, against the plastic, the, for example, is a good uh, uh, proposal, and we have to develop this kind of concrete, of concrete measures. And in, in the next days, in December, before the end of the year, the Commission of Ursula von der Leyen will present uh, for the different member states what are the concrete measures she proposed to develop and to implement in different countries. All right, well, it seems like we still have just enough time for one more audience question, so hands up again. Let's see, um, let us have the lady behind you, Nino, in the striped jacket there. Hello, so my question regards the constant wave of anti-democratic values we mm -hmm. see, especially in the Eastern states, such mm -hmm. as Romania, Poland, Hungary, and so on. So my question is, what is your take on that? How would you think of tackling this issue? Because it's becoming more and more important. Thank yeah. you. It's, it's, a, it's a very important point, because uh, the, the foundation of Europe is based on these very important values, um, democracy, freedom of press, freedom of, of, of media, this kind of uh, important, important freedoms and, and rights. And I think the best approach we can develop in the future in order to, to strengthen this strong foundation in the different countries, uh, it is to try to develop a permanent screening of the progress we have to make in the different countries. Not only in these countries, but in the different European countries. We have to, to, to ask 
How is it possible to, to be better, to have a stronger democracy, to have more possibilities for the, for the people, to have uh, the guarantee for their freedoms, for their, their rights? And that, that's why in the past, uh, as a Belgian prime minister, I had proposed with the support of uh, other European countries to develop a, a new mechanism, the peer review. It would be a permanent observation of the progress we have to make in the different countries in order to guarantee these strong values, because Europe, without these European values, wouldn't exist. And that's why it's so crucial, crucial in my opinion, to save, to protect, to guarantee these fundamental European values. So I'd actually like to ask a follow-up on that, because you made mention of this peer review system, but these countries, Hungary and Poland, also have often criticized Brussels for acting like an external hegemon, for imposing European rules on their national sovereignty. Won't a peer review system just strengthen this view? I, I have the feeling, and, uh, and, and we have started the, the discussions at the European level the last months on this uh, issue. Um, I, have the, I have the feeling that if we try to develop this mechanism with this idea that each European country has to look how is it possible to make progress, it would be another approach, because what's important for me is to be efficient, to make progress. We can uh, speak, we can uh, uh, be very vocal, but if at the end of the day we don't make progress, why, why, is it, uh, is it, uh, why would it be the good, the good approach? And that's why my, my priority is really to try to develop this kind of mechanism, this kind of models, because I think it would be more efficient. All right, thank you for those audience questions, Mr. Michel. We still have some few more questions to ask you from ourselves. So, building up on this progress you were just talking about, let's look at the picture of the European Union at large. It, situations like Brexit, the divisions within the Union, all beg the question, and that is, which direction should we expect the Union to go? Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has produced a white paper that outlines five distinct scenarios in European integration. Which of them do you <laughs> prefer? <laughs> no, it's... it's uh, it's certain that uh, based on my new job in December, my, my, my responsibility will be to guarantee the unity between the different members of the, of the, the Council. I am pragmatic. Uh, I, I love this project. I am quite confident because I, I think uh, that we need uh, a strong European Union. And what's important for me it's not, uh, I repeat, to open a new debate on the treaties. Maybe in the future it will be a necessity to reform again the treaties. But in the short term, I don't think it is what we need. In the short term, my personal opinion is to, to use the current rules, to use the current uh, institutional realities in order to make progress climate change, digital agenda, migration, security, defense, to be stronger at the international level. These are the concrete priorities. And what do we need, in my opinion, more than a reform of the treaties in the short term? What we need is trust, confidence between the people and between the leaders, point one. And what we need, maybe, is common sense, more common sense, to be pragmatic in order to make progress. Migration, for example, what do we need? We need to protect, to, to, to protect better um, the frontiers, the, the borders, the, the, the external borders. The, the, the borders in Italy, in Greece, are not only the, it, the, 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 the borders of Italy, they are the borders uh, of Europe, and we have to, 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 to show more solidarity in order to protect the borders. And at the same time, we have to fulfill our international obligations to guarantee the dignity for, for, for the people. And that's why we have to uh, develop the right, the right balance. It's what we need. And if we would decide to consider common sense as a possible key in order to build compromise, I'm confident we will make more steps in the short term. But in that long-term vision, in the past you have expressed support for a so-called multi-speed Europe, a two-speed Europe. Do you still hold this, this uh, I, support I, for I, this view? I, I, I would say that at the moment you have different situations at the European level. Uh, look at the, the Eurozone, for example. Not all the member states are part of uh, the Eurozone. Look at the Schengen zone. It is the same. Uh, th there are at the moment some differences uh, uh, at the European level. But my priority is to work in order to build day after day a strong unity at the European level. But 
the unity is not enough uh, just to be united, but uh, without the possibility to decide, it would not be acceptable. And that's why, at the same time, uh, because the unity is important, it's also important to take decisions together. And to take decisions together, we need a dialogue, we need to understand very well what are the different uh, priorities in the different countries, to understand also the different traditions in the different uh, uh, countries and based on the reality it's important to try to uh, take decision and, and just not to, to wait. Uh, my dream is not a European Council uh, always reacting uh, after the tweet of uh, an American president, uh, after a referendum in the United Kingdom. Uh, my dream is a European, uh, European project, European Union working day after day in order to prepare uh, our own and common future. So let's discuss this unity a bit more because you already made reference to it a bit earlier on immigration. This is an issue that really has divided Europe over the past few years and still is dividing us in terms of finding an internal common immigration policy. How will you in your capacity help to find unity amongst the, the, the heads of states? I, I think uh, I, I repeat that the, 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 the potential of the external borders uh, is, a key, is a key issue. And we made a lot of progress uh, the last years uh, since uh, uh, 2016 on this, uh, on this issue. But it's not enough. We have also to, to look at the solidarity between the different uh, members uh, of uh, the European Union. This is also an important moment because the new Commission will propose, uh, probably next year, a new pact for migration in order to find the right balance uh, between solidarity and responsibility. My opinion is that we have to support more the, the, the efforts that we have to do in order to control the borders. Uh, Italy, uh, Greece, Spain, all these countries have to be more supported by the, European EU, uh, by the European Union in order to control more our borders, point one. And at the same time, we have to, to develop more common procedure in order to take quickly decisions when we uh, we have to to um, to to uh, to, uh, to look at uh, uh, the procedures introduced by the asylum seekers mm -hmm. and are you confident in your abilities that by that time that the new deal is on the table you will be able to reconcile the interests of the eu 28 hasn't your own government uh, suffered a collapse because of immigration issues. Yeah, it is, it is uh, an interesting signal. Uh, one year ago, uh, the Belgian government faced a political crisis because of uh, migration. And it shows that at the European level, the last years, it was um, uh, the strategy uh, from, from uh, some political leaders, political parties, uh, in order to use this migration issue, this migration topic, uh, in order to try to divide uh, the people in the countries and at the European uh, level. And that's why, I repeat, we need more common sense. We need to explain the truth to the people. Migration is a difficult issue. It's not possible to accept uh, all the migrants. We need uh, clear rules and we need to implement uh, the decisions when we take uh, decisions. And look, migration, uh, another important point. I remember 2016, it was a big migration crisis. But if I look uh, the situation today, uh, what are the numbers? It shows that we have improved the situation. It's maybe not the perception, it's maybe not the feeling, because some little parties are trying to use migration as political tool in in order to convince the people, in order to divide uh, the people. What we did is not enough. We have to, to be more efficient. We have to do more. We have also to cooperate more with Africa. That's why I think this uh, uh, important, uh, in my opinion, aligned for the future with Africa will be key. The demography in Africa will be very important in the future. And even with a strong growth in Africa, it will not be probably enough in order to absorb uh, this demography. And that's why we need to develop the investments in Africa. We need to make the African countries more attractive for private investments, in order to develop the infrastructures they need in order to develop the economy and to, uh, and to uh, uh, increase the, 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 the opportunities for the people. So another issue that has been recently divided the European Council was the issue of enlarging our union. France vetoed, of course, the 
as beginning ascension talks with northern Macedonia and with Albania. Do you think this veto was a mistake? I, I th it's not a mistake because our decision was not to refuse to open the negotiations, but, but it was to take more time in order to think about this situation and to see what are the possibilities to take together, united, uh, a decision. It's an important decision we have to, we have to take. Uh, and I would say that uh, the, the debates in the Council a few weeks ago uh, about uh, this enlargement process were very interesting, intense, constructive, positive. And what's my, my feeling? My feeling is that uh, an important point is not only to decide uh, do we start and if uh, we decide when uh, the negotiations with Northern Macedonia uh, or Albania, it's also how is it possible to improve and modernize this enlargement process. And there is a lot to say about that. Uh, for example, the reversibility of this process, the differentiation of this process. And I think that there is the possibility in the next two weeks to, to try to work together, the 27 countries, in order to, to, uh, to have an agreement uh, about a modernization of this enlargement process, point one, and to see what would be the consequences in the short term for the different uh, countries. Another important point, in my opinion, is the fact that we have to develop with some uh, countries important uh, strategically for us, for Europe, a form of strategic partnership and to, and to, um, to decide which are the priorities in order to improve the relationship in order to, to develop more stability, more predictability in countries which are strategically important for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would you support the French proposal of revising this uh, um, enlargement uh, scheme? The, 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 the last European meeting, we took the decision uh, to um, open uh, a political debate uh, in the very short term uh, in order to see which are the principles for, uh, for an important reform of this process of enlargement. And it will be one of my, my responsibilities to work uh, on this topic and to try to convince the, to the, to convince the different uh, leaders to, to, to accept concrete proposals. We will try and I hope that we will succeed. All right, Mr. Michel, unfortunately we are running out of time here today, but we would like to ask you one final question before we wrap up today's interview. At the end of your presidency, what are the three things you would like to look back on and say that with success that you were able to accomplish? I would say three, three, three things. Uh, f first, uh, climate change. It's crucial to, 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 to to take important decisions to implement uh, measures, point one. Two, digitalization. We need um, to play a stronger role because uh, the digitalization will, be, will, will, will have a, a huge effect uh, on our lives. And third point, I, I would like uh, that the European Union will play, play plays a, a more important role at the international level. I don't want the European Union uh, becoming uh, the junior partner of, of other powers in the world. I think that we have a role to play with our values, with our interests, without being aggressive, without being offensive, but because our values are strong, because we are in favor of more cooperation, and because uh, the, the global challenges uh, requires, requires more global cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Michel. Well, we'll look forward to welcoming you back with us to share these great success stories. But thank you for your answers. Thank you for your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, President-elect of the European Council, Mr. Thank Charles you. Michel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.